Boy, this is an attentive crowd. I'm not accustomed to this. <laughs> better, better behave than our normal, our normal audience. Uh, my name's Nate Fick. I'm the CEO of the Center for a New American Security. And it's a real honor uh, tonight to introduce our conversation between Jim Wright and Greg Jaffe on Jim's new book, Those Who've Borne the Battle, The History of America's Wars and Those Who Fought Them. And in addition to having a, an abiding professional interest in these topics at the Center for a New American Security, tonight has a very special personal connection for me. I was an undergraduate at Dartmouth in the 1990s, just on the cusp of Jim's presidency, and planning to go to medical school after graduation, but I failed a chemistry class and was forced to rethink my career options, uh, literally. And um, so I was back to square one, trying to consider what I was gonna do after college. And I went to a talk one evening at the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy, a talk by the then Pentagon uh, correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, Tom Ricks, who's now a colleague here at CNAS. And Tom had recently written a book called Making the Corps uh, about a uh, Marine Corps boot camp platoon that he followed through training. And in the course of his talk, Tom was advocating uh, for the presence of ROTC on college campuses. And at the end of his remarks, somebody stood up and said, Mr. Ricks, you're wrong. What ROTC will do is militarize our campus and threaten its culture of tolerance. I remember the quote, it was sort of striking to me, so I wrote it down. And Tom's rejoinder was, no, you're wrong. What it will do is liberalize the military. And he didn't mean politically. He meant what it will do is help ensure that the United States military is a cross-section of the country, geographically, socioeconomically. Uh, in every demographic, the military uh, should be representative. And Tom went on to tease out that argument to its logical conclusion, which was, that we would go to war less frequently and be more committed when we do. And so that argument resonated with me. I, I ended up getting commissioned on the day I graduated, uh, served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and several years after getting out, uh, took the helm here at CNAS with my, uh, our former president, John Noggle, who's here this evening. And John and I uh, felt very strongly that an organization like ours, committed to pragmatic national security policies ought to be doing something in the veteran space. But we weren't quite sure what to do. We were motivated uh, by a couple of beliefs. First was that in the era of the all-volunteer force, veterans' issues are national security issues because how we treat the veterans of past wars has a direct bearing on who will be willing to fight our future wars. And the second conviction that we had uh, was that the veteran space is very different from more traditional areas of national security, the intelligence community, for instance, or budgets and acquisitions. Uh, those are areas that have deep reservoirs of human capital dedicated to analysis. And the veterans community uh, has some of those, but it has an awful lot of advocates. Uh, and we thought that one thing that we could do as, a, as an independent platform was bring some more analytical capability to bear in the area of veterans' work. So those two beliefs, that veterans' policy is a part of our national security policy and that the community would benefit from a deeper reservoir of analytical capacity influenced a program at CNAS uh, that we call Military Veterans and, the, and Society. Uh, Dr. Meg Harrell and Nancy Berglis lead our work on these issues and so it's under the aegis of that program uh, that we hold this event this evening. So Jim Wright is the President Emeritus and Eliezer Wheelock Professor of History at Dartmouth. He was the 16th President of the college from 1998 until 2009, and previously he was on the faculty there since 1969. But more impressively, I think, he enlisted in the Marine Corps at age 17 and was discharged three years later with the august rank of Lance Corporal. <laughs> and since 2005, Jim has become one of uh, the leading voices in the United States, encouraging uh, veterans of these current conflicts to continue their educations. And in that capacity, uh, he has been honored and recognized in many different ways. I think the most impressive, perhaps, uh, was his invitation to throw out the first pitch at Fenway. Uh, but there were many more serious honors as well. 
And uh, as I think many of you in here know, certainly those of you affiliated with, with Jim from his time at Dartmouth, uh, you know that his partner in all of this, his wife Susan, uh, is, is also here this evening. So Susan, we welcome you. And Greg Jaffe is the Pentagon correspondent uh, at the Washington Post, where he's been since 2009. Before the Post, Greg, like Tom Ricks, was at the Wall Street Journal. And Greg has done some of the very best reporting from Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, not only at the tactical and operational level, but also at the strategic and political level. Unlike many of his counterparts, though, Greg has been exceptionally good at bridging the divide between what's happening on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan and what's happening here at home, and also what happens to the veterans of these conflicts when they return home. He spent much of 2011 at the Post writing about how a decade of war has altered the military's relationship to society. And this isn't the first time Greg's been on a book stage at CNAS. He took a leave uh, to write uh, The Fourth Star about four army generals, John Abizay, George Casey, Pete Corelli, and David Petraeus, who had a great impact on the direction of their service and in many ways the course uh, of, of these wars. Uh, Greg also shared a Pulitzer Prize in 2000 for a series on defense spending. So two final notes. Uh, please mark your calendars for our sixth annual CNAS conference on June 13th, right here at the Willard. And I'd ask you not to leave this evening before buying a copy of Jim's book. Uh, if I were more cynical, I would have tucked drink tickets inside every copy. But uh, I trust that you'll buy a copy in the back before heading to the bar, and Jim will be here to sign. So along with my partner here, uh, Dr. Kristen Lord, and the rest of the CNAS team, we welcome Jim and Greg. We thank you all for coming, and we look forward to an engaging evening. Thank you, Nate. Thank you. Well, well, thanks very much. I, I want to say, just before I start grilling you about your book, that I read it and thoroughly enjoyed it. As somebody who's thought a lot about this subject, I thought I knew a fair amount about it. But it's, what, what makes the book so terrific is that it really does take you through layers and layers of history. And you can see how our... Con have these, some of the concepts and the big themes of the book evolve over time. So for me, I've been looking at it in a sort of a 10-year snapshot, but it's great to be able to see the, trace the, some of these themes all the way back to the Revolutionary War, which the book does in a really engaging uh, and easy to read way. So congratulations on Thank that. Thank you, Greg. Um, well, let me start off a little bit about um, some of your personal experiences and how they led you to do this book. Um, one of the things that's kind of neat is you identify yourself rather than a depression baby as a World War II baby. And I wanted to know a little bit about what you thought that means. Yeah, I, I was born in 1939, and so my earliest memories are of uh, World War II. Uh, my father was drafted into the Army in 1943. He was 30 years old. He had two children. Uh, the Army, uh, the United States, was uh, needing to, to reach into the, into the population uh, to draft citizens uh, for the war. And uh, I remember at the end of the war, uh, it seemed like everybody, every father in town was coming home from the war. There were tremendous celebrations and energy in the community. And uh, it, uh, it's a small town in Illinois that was General Grant's uh, town home before the Civil War. So a lot of Civil War uh, records are there and statuary. And uh, I just grew up uh, in that environment. Uh, and uh, when I graduated from high school in 1957, uh, I, uh, going to college was not something that I was thinking about. No one in my family had done that. Uh, so with uh, uh, four other classmates of Galena High School, we joined the Marines. Uh, there were 25 boys in the class, five of us joined the Marines, another half dozen joined other branches of the military service, and probably four or five went on to college. And that was, uh, that was the normal breakdown of that particular high school at that time. Now remember, in the 1950s, I think everyone thought about going into the service. There was a draft. Uh, and uh, it was uh, a likelihood for many people, uh, all young boys, to think about going into the service. Uh, and uh, I wanted to be a Marine, and uh, rather than wait for a draft, uh, I joined. Uh, and then I uh, uh, came out of uh, the Marine Corps and uh, decided to go to college. And once I started, I never stopped. I spent the rest of my life <laughs> on a college campus, and I'm still learning. And uh, to be honest, I sort of uh, drifted away. The, the Vietnam War was, was not something that that, that I was supportive of at the end. I, I was deeply concerned about the troops who were over there fighting. And in 2005, uh, uh, I was uh, got focusing on Fallujah. 
and uh, mentioned to a, uh, a friend uh, that uh, I was really concerned about these young Marines I saw in November of 2004 at Fallujah, and he said, why don't you go down to the hospital? And so I came down to Bethesda Hospital at that time, and I've been doing it ever since. I was out there this morning, it's, I don't know, probably 25 or 30 times I've been to the hospital over the last uh, several years, and I just uh, have uh, been deeply moved and also uh, impressed uh, by uh, these young men and young women that I'm meeting at the hospital, and I want to do something uh, to be supportive of them. And this book uh, just sort of evolved uh, from that. Can I ask, you use a phrase, um to describe your growing up uh, in Illinois as uh, the pleasure of being in a community of veterans, I think was the phrase. Why did you use that and sort of what did you mean by it? Well, it's just, it, it was a community of veterans in that post-World War II era. And of course, I knew a lot of people who went to, uh, to Korea. Uh, they're just a few years ahead of me in high school. Like, uh, you know, my, my town of 4,100 uh, uh, people had 18 uh, killed in World War II. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a town where just everyone uh, joined the military, and uh, it, uh, it it was not it was not a community, and it's hard, I think, to convey what this means uh, in in rhetoric that we'd understand today. It wasn't a, a militaristic place. I don't know that anyone, you know, I never heard anybody talk uh, favorably about war. It's not that people made a career of it. I only know a few people who stayed in uh, beyond their initial uh, enlistment tour. Uh, they went in. It was just something that was expected of them, and then they. Then they came home, but uh, there was a lot of energy uh, there with these veterans, particularly after World War II. I'm just going to ask a couple more questions about your personal experience because it's fascinating. But you talk about joining the Marine Corps, going to Biloxi, I believe. Um, talk a little bit about how your experience in the Marine Corps sort of changed your view of the country and um, of sort of your obligations as a citizen. Yeah, I was, uh, I, I went to, uh, to MCRD San Diego and uh, Camp Pendleton for infantry training and then I, I went into the Marine Air Group and I went to uh, Jacksonville then Biloxi, Mississippi at the Keesler Air Force Base there. And, and uh, you know, being in, in Biloxi, Mississippi in the South in the 1950s as I was gave this a uh, young boy from Midwest, uh, a different uh, view of, uh, of a lot of things, uh, certainly uh, race relations. Uh, I was in Japan. Uh, at the time, Japan was just recovering uh, from World War II, just feeling its own uh, confidence uh, again. Uh, I served with uh, Marines who had been in Korea and World War II. The NCOs, almost all of them were Korean War veterans, and many of the officers were. And it was just, uh, it was a world where it was much bigger than the small town in the Midwest, uh, where I grew up, uh, and uh, it did give me a different perspective on, on the world. It gave me a tremendous uh, sense of self-confidence. Uh, being a Marine, I guess, can do that, of discipline, although the, the nuns that taught me at St. Michael's School did as good a job as any Marine drill instructor did at, uh, in doing that. You know, I was going to ask you a little bit to talk about your hospital visits, too. And one of the things that so powerfully comes out of the book is the sense that the cost of our wars are not really borne by society, but often by, by the individuals who fight them. Um, uh, and I, I wanted to get, uh, just I talk a little bit about what it's, what it's like to go there. What kinds of questions do the soldiers and Marines that you meet with ask you? And what sorts of questions do you ask them? Yeah, I've been going, as I said, since 2005. And, and uh, I've done the same thing every visit. I, I sort of go uh, bed to bed in, in the ward and, and talk to uh, to these guys, and uh, remember Bethesda and Walter Reed before that. These were places. These are places where the, the most seriously injured ha are coming. Uh, some people with lesser injuries might go to a regional hospital someplace else, but at Bethesda and Walter Reed, they're pretty seriously injured. And, and certainly, in the beginning, uh, there were a lot of uh, gunshot wounds. So when I was visiting the Marines at at, uh, at uh, Bethesda, they were coming out of Fallujah within a few years. It was more from IED blasts, and, uh, and in Iraq, uh, where most of them were coming from for several years, uh, they tended to be in vehicles, so they had a different range of injuries due to being in a, in a vehicle when, a, when there was a tremendous explosion that destroyed the vehicle. Today, uh, out there, uh, there are a couple of gunshot wounds, uh, and, and I've always asked these guys, or I often ask them, did you see the person who did this? And none of them, uh, very few people have ever seen it. it, 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 it it's hard to fight uh, in, uh, in a war such as this. Uh, you know, there, there was a play on Broadway uh, 
uh, a year or two ago, and uh, where the line uh, is, uh, we're the only ones wearing uniforms, and uh, you know, we're not accustomed, or we're not trained. We don't think of wars this way. We think of armies fighting each other in a field, and that's not the way uh, these wars uh, are, uh, are being uh, fought. So they don't see who fought them. There were a couple of gunshot wounds uh, this morning, and I talked to them, and uh, they're largely a sniper. One was, there, there was one guy was in a real firefight. I don't know if I've talked to anybody in a firefight in some time. You were just over there. It's just, uh, it, it's a war of explosives. It's, it's a war where people don't quite understand uh, where, where the enemy is going to hit next, so they have to always be prepared for it. I talk to them about what they want to do next, and uh, I, I continue to tell them that I wish they would think about going on to school to pursue their education. And uh, I, as I said to a few people this morning, uh, you've got to set your own goals and aim high. You can do anything you want to do. You've already demonstrated this. This, this one young man I was talking to had serious injuries, uh, multiple, had lost multiple limbs. He was uh, in a Marine uh, unit that, that was detonating explosives and he had been doing this, his second tour over there. And when he was uh, dis uh, disarming one, another one went off right next to it. And, uh, and I was telling him, you, know, you, you have proved already because of what you have done. You have the discipline, you have the self-confidence, you have the ability to do anything, and you've just got to do that. And that's, that's the theme that I continue to follow uh, with them. My concern uh, about uh, the way that our country thinks about war today is that we don't know what war is like. I don't pretend to know what war was like. I, nobody shot at me. I didn't shoot at anyone. I've sure read about it a lot. I've talk to people a lot, but I, I don't think there's anything like uh, the experience of being in a combat situation. But, but people don't understand that. There is a, a, a detachment and an abstraction even uh, that we uh, tend to have when we think about those people who are fighting our wars. First of all, most people don't know anyone uh, who is over there. They're not a, a cross-section of American society, the, the, the young men and women who are serving in the military today. Uh, they're not uh, our children or our neighbor's children or kids from the neighborhood and most neighborhoods in this country who are fighting over there today. And so that means that it's, uh, it's, everyone is a bit more detached uh, from this. I think that there, there is a caring. I, I, I think that everyone uh, says the right things and I think they mean the right to say the right things about their, their, their concern and their caring about uh, these veterans uh, and these young men and women who are coming back. Uh, it's, it's genuine but they don't quite know who they are. When you ask them about the, the incident in which they were injured or wounded, do, they, do you get the sense they want to talk about it? Or do you I've, never, I've never had anyone say, I, I just soon not talk about it. Uh, they, they, everyone has answered that question. Somebody told me that when I first went there in 2005, you should ask them, feel free to ask them, and I have felt free to ask them, and I, I continue to do that, and uh, they are willing. Uh, to talk about it. Uh, some of them, uh, they remember it pretty crisply. And again, remember the nature of these injuries. Some of these uh, people you talk to in the wards are, are rather heavily medicated. There's a tremendous amount of discomfort. Uh, they're basically there, missing limbs. Uh, pus and blood is still uh, leaking out. Uh, they, they have a lot of tubes coming into them. I mean, these are, these are pretty serious cases. But uh, they, they, they stop and uh, talk, yeah, this is what happened to me. And the other thing I was struck by at the very beginning when I would talk to them about what they want to do next, they say, I want to go back with my unit. And, and, and my first uh, reaction to that was, uh, wow, uh, these, these, these guys uh, take this seriously. They're, they're listening to the president uh, and uh, they're listening to others and they're still concerned about weapons of mass destruction or whatever the purpose of the war was. Uh, but I came to realize very quickly that that most of the most of the people in the wards, most of the people who are serving today, don't, don't don't think of war in big geopolitical terms, or you know what what American diplomacy is. Obviously, if they they feel the United States is threatened, they want to respond to that. But when they want to get back to their unit, they literally want to get back to their unit. They want to get back to those guys with whom they were serving. That's a terribly important thing to them. They're concerned, and some of them will talk about somebody who was injured after they left, after they came back. I remember. One young Marine I talked to, and he was still having trouble when he was up at Launchstuhl in Germany. He heard about a, a friend of his uh, who was killed on Thanksgiving Day in Fallujah, and he just, 
He said, I should have been there, I should have been there. And this guy had multiple gunshot wounds. There was no way he could have been there. But there, there is this, the, they look out for each other and they want to look out for each other. Can I ask how you feel after you walk out of the hospital? Do you feel angry, sad, inspired? I feel inspired and, and moved and uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 these guys, when you talk to them, I mean, obviously late at night, they, you know, they're human. They have to feel sorry for themselves. They have to wonder, what am I going to do next? But I have never heard anyone uh, express, uh, try to blame anyone or uh, uh, say, isn't it terrible this happened to me? That they, they, They're not looking uh, for that kind of sympathy. They're not looking for you to be sad in talking about them. Uh, I'm, I'm moved, I'm deeply moved and inspired uh, every time. I mean, there are times I leave a, a hospital room and stand in, in the hall and try to check myself from starting to cry before I move into the next room. And because uh, it's, uh, these are very human and very moving experiences. And, and that's one of the themes that, 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 I, that I really think is important in my book is that, that I, I War is, in many perverse ways, the most human experience there is. It's hard to imagine something more human uh, than putting somebody uh, in this sort of a situation. I, I, I point out in the introduction of this that we, we teach our children when they are, 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 are this, this high two basic things. Uh, we teach them not to put themselves in dangerous situations, to look out for themselves, and we teach them not to harm anybody else. And that's a basic human instruction. It, it's a moral instruction. It's a religious instruction. It's a legal uh, restriction. You should not harm others. Then we take these 18 and 19 and 20 year olds and we say, okay, uh, guess what? You're going to have to put yourself in harm's way and you're going to have to be willing. You're going to have to be willing uh, to harm other people. And uh, that's, that's a tough retooling uh, that people go through, and, and I think it's remarkable. And then all of a sudden they're out and they say, okay, go back to rules one and two. Don't, don't put yourself at any risk and don't harm anyone else and, and forget about what you just experienced. And guess what? It is not possible for most of these guys ever to forget about what it is that they just experienced. And I think that's, that's, that is, that's a powerful thing to think about what it is that we're asking, no, no longer the kid down the street, but we're asking people to do. Well, talk to me a little bit about why you wanted to write this book and then sort of how your training as a historian helped you sort of frame questions and find answers. As a journalist, I find myself when I'm writing about these issues, I try and find the most moving compelling narrative that I can, and then I sort of figure out the point afterwards, but uh, uh, I yeah. think... <laughs> I, I was, I, you know, when, when I stepped down as president of Dartmouth, uh, a lot of people say, so you're going to write a book? And I'd say, no, I'm not going to write a book. Now, they, they were intending, I think, and asking about what I think is the standard book that former college presidents write, that there, there are stacks of them on shelves of, of, uh, of sort of saying, if, you know, I could have done this if I'd been permitted, or whatever, and I was not going to add uh, to that particular uh, stack of books. Uh, right as I was finishing up at Dartmouth, uh, Bob Bergenau, who was the Chancellor of Berkeley, uh, invited me to come out and give the Jefferson Lecture at Berkeley. And I was delighted and honored to do this. And, and the committee that was in charge of the uh, lecture uh, asked if I would uh, talk about my experience over the last three or four years then working with veterans, because by then I had worked to help set up a counseling program in the hospitals. Uh, Heather Bernard is here today, who's been counseling at Bethesda and Walter Reed from the beginning. I had worked with a couple of Marines, uh, remarkable men, uh, Jim Webb and John Warner on the, the GI Bill, and I was delighted to, to have been able to participate in that. And in a meeting in Senator Warner's office, we, we, we came up with what became the Yellow Ribbon Program to enable people to, to, to use this, uh, this GI Bill in private institutions. And so I, they want me to talk about this experience. I said, well, I'm a historian. I said, as I've been doing this work, I keep uh, thinking about, you know, what, what was it like, what did we really do with the World War II veterans? And what was, this, what was it like coming out of the Civil War? And I said, I wanted to include some of that in the lecture. And I thought I'd go to the library and find a volume or two that would summarize this and that would give me the background I needed. And uh, there was no such book. And so I found myself needing to immerse myself more and more in uh, the history of the, how Americans have thought about war. 
uh, how it is we mobilize for war, who, would ask, who is it we ask to fight our wars, and finally, how do we treat those people that fight our wars. And these are the things that I've looked at from the revolution to Afghanistan. And, and quite frankly, uh, Greg, the book wrote itself. Uh, it, uh, I, I helped a lot. I worked pretty hard uh, help, <laughs> helping it along. But the, this, this was a book that, that you know, I, I wouldn't want to try to over-dramatize this, but it, it's a book that did want, uh, did want to be written, and I was uh, delighted to be along for the ride, and I just, I'm not a military historian. Uh, I'm uh, not a historian of, of this wide swath of American history. I used to teach, and I wrote some books on American political history, late 19th, early 20th century American political history, but I'm not a... I'm not a historian of this subject. And I make that clear at the beginning, but I, I've surely immersed myself in it. And as, as you or somebody said, it's kind of a meditation. And I guess it is that. I, I really, uh, I'm concerned about uh, what it is that we have done. And we've, we, we have evolved historically uh, from the very beginning, uh, coming out of the American Revolution. Uh, there was a sense, and George Washington articulated it well, that every citizen has a responsibility uh, to serve and to contribute financially when the republic is threatened. And that uh, he thought everyone should be a member of a militia unit until they're 50 years of age and should be prepared to come uh, to stand up when the country is uh, threatened. The other side of this was that there was, because this was an obligation of democracy, there was no obligation, there, the, 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 there was no counter obligation, there was no contract for the republic to do something for them. You serve because you're supposed to serve. If you're injured, we'll do something for you, although in the early wars we didn't do very much for them. Injury almost necessitated missing a limb, and even that wasn't always sufficient to, to get support from the government. Uh, widows and orphans didn't always get support, but that had to do, that was less a philosophy and more because we didn't have the resources uh, to do it. And this evolved over a period of time. Uh, and uh, we, we began to mobilize armies in different ways. The first draft was during the Civil War. There, there were more people drafted in the Confederate States than in the North, but the drafts seem sort of contrary to the whole idea of a citizen soldier. You're supposed to be eager to join when the Republic uh, is uh, threatened, and uh, World War I uh, was, uh, was uh, largely draft, and uh, World War II was almost all draft. In fact, uh, by I think or by 42, uh, the government stopped uh, accepting enlistments uh, you, because the problem was that so many people were enlisting in the Marine Corps or the Navy because they didn't want to go into the Army and the Army uh, infantry. Uh, they were captured by the idea of going in the Marines or the, or the Navy. The, the, the Air Force was still a unit of the Army during the war. And so they stopped off, uh, they stopped having enlistments so that everyone would be eligible for the draft. Uh, the only way you could enlist if you were not yet draft eligible, which meant at age 17. Uh, the people were not drafted until age 18, 17, you were eligible to enlist. And the Marine Corps, for example, was much younger than the Army during World War II because a lot of 17-year-olds joined the Marine Corps uh, before they were draft eligible. Uh, Korea was, was less, uh, less draft. It was a significant part of mobilization. Vietnam, by the end of the war, I think 60% of the people who were serving in Vietnam were draftees. And then, of course, we moved away from the draft in 1973, and we haven't had it since then. But, you know, even, even with the draft, uh, there is still a concept of citizen soldiers. Uh, you may have been required to come in, but uh, you, have come, you have stepped up as a citizen of the Republic. And I think that this was uh, terribly important. Obviously, the, the composition of the military today is quite different. Uh, these are all volunteers. You know, it's interesting in your book you describe kind of after World War II, there's a sense for the first time that even if our veterans aren't injured, that we owe them something uh, in terms of uh, restarting their life. Talk a little bit about that, sort of how that idea takes hold and how it's different from how we viewed um, the folks who fought our wars prior to World War II. Well, before that, there was really a sense that uh, we do not owe healthy veterans anything. And uh, after World War I, uh, the, uh, you, you may recall uh, reading when you studied history at some point about the, uh, the bonus army. Uh, the, 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 the Congress had, over President Coolidge's veto, approved legislation that would provide a bonus, uh, really a pension, for those who had served in World War I but would not be payable until 1945, the idea of 
putting off payment. It's, it's a time-honored concept in the Congress, if you can <laughs> put it off for a while. And then when the De Great Depression started, a lot of the veterans uh, were, were unemployed and they asked uh, for, uh, for some money uh, from, the, uh, from the government. Uh, and uh, uh, President Hoover uh, said no, uh, that uh, they had served in the military and that was uh, a cost of democracy. And there was a tremendous riot here in Washington. Well, not a riot, there were marches in Washington. There was a fear it would lead to riot. And, and uh, they sent uh, General MacArthur in to, to, to clear out uh, uh, the World War II bonus, uh, World War I bonus army. Franklin Roosevelt came in with a much different attitude toward these things, but he said exactly the same thing as Hoover did. Uh, uh, no, uh, we don't owe people money uh, if they are healthy. Uh, if they're out of a job, uh, we need to deal with that in terms of dealing with all people who are out of a job, but this is not uh, a result of their serving in the military. And so World War II uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, uh, changed his mind, and part of it was a great fear in 43, 44, that when all of these veterans came home and there were no jobs, what would they do? And uh, would, would we face uh, real domestic strife as a result of this? And quite frankly, the American Legion, which played a major role in helping to secure passage of the GI Bill, uh, wasn't uh, beyond threatening once in a while. Who knows what uh, these well-armed and well-trained guys will do? when they come home from the war. There was none of that. And the GI Bill was just a wonderful piece of legislation that did provide a tremendous range of support for college. It provided loans for home and business. It provided unemployment benefits for a year. And it really did effectively make that transition work. And the Korean War veterans, the Vietnam War veterans had basically the same thing. The Iraq Afghanistan veterans didn't have the same package because uh, they were dealing with the old Montgomery GI Bill, which was a peacetime GI Bill, and that's when 2008 uh, Senator Webb's bill was passed, and, and President Bush signed it, which provided for the, for the uh, post-9-11 GI Bill. Well, I'm going to ask one more question to you, and then I'm going to throw it open here. Uh, okay. Since, otherwise, I'm going to monopolize all your time. Um, but one of the things I found fascinating is this book um, really gets at the sort of composition of our military and con contrasts sort of today and how unrepresentative it feels versus earlier eras. It, it was fascinating to read in World War II that um, if you were from a higher socioeconomic background, you were more likely to be a casualty um, than from lower backgrounds. And then that begins to shift with Korea and seems to shift with each war a little bit going forward. So I guess if you could talk about that and then just also how fundamentally unrepresentative, I'm going to load up questions because this is my last chance. How unrepresentative it, our military is today in some ways of our broader society and whether it matters and whether we should really care. Yeah, World War II uh, was really, as somebody said, the best and the brightest uh, did fight. Uh, the draft, the, the, there were no exemptions. There were very few exemptions from the draft. If you were a minister, the, there, there was an exemption from the draft. And there were uh, exemptions for certain types of occupations that seemed to be defense-related or war-related. Uh, but that was up to the local draft board to, uh, to, to determine whether or not you fit that, uh, that qualification. Uh, and uh, Korea uh, had uh, educational deferments. If you were enrolled in college, the local draft board could give you a deferment from being drafted. They didn't have to, it was up to the local draft board, but there are a lot of deferments then, and so the Korean War was far more blue collar. And Vietnam was the most blue collar war because there were categorical deferments for anyone who was enrolled in college, and so that, uh, that basically had a class bias, and I think that the, the, uh, the, the, it was uh, very much a, a working class war, and this became increasingly the case in the last three or four years of the war in Vietnam when it was more and more marked by draftees. World War II, the, the highest the socioeconomic communities did sometimes have the, the highest casualties. I think one of the factors there, and I've never been able to really to, to, to find the data that would allow me to, to prove this, but I, I really think it's true, is that the Navy and the, and the Army Air Force took very heavy casualties in World War II. And almost by definition, certainly the Army Air Force, uh, pilots and people were on planes, but also the Navy 
uh, tended to, to be more people from maybe with, co with, with college uh, education or college degrees, people uh, coming from better neighborhoods uh, perhaps, uh, having more schooling, and I think that was a factor there. Uh, Korea and Vietnam, well, these, these were infantry wars again, and, uh, and uh, so you, obviously there were heavy casualties from the Air Force, not so much from the Navy in those wars, and so you do see a shift. And once you, once you start talking about uh, infantry casualties, you're almost always talking more and more about blue collar. Let me ask the question just uh, if the military is unrepresentative or seems less representative of our society today. To what extent do you think that's true, and to what extent should it matter to us? Should we be worried about it? Well, it is true, uh, and uh, the, the military today tends to be more uh, rural than urban. Uh, they tend to be more uh, southern and uh, midwestern and small town western than they do uh, northeastern. Uh, they uh, tend to be more uh, people uh, who, who have not had a, a college education. There was a concern in 1973 when we went to the all-volunteer army that the military uh, would become uh, the uh, a force of the black and, and the, uh, of, of, of people of color and the poor. That's, that's not been true. Uh, the military today is more lower middle class or middle class than it is poor. And uh, you know, whites and blacks uh, are, are overrepresented in the military. And that, some of that has to do with the Southern, uh, the song Southern component, uh, Asian, uh, Hispanic, Latinos, are underrepresented in the military. And uh, you know, the, the poorest, poorest Americans are not, uh, being, uh, are not enlisting in the military. Part of that is that the, the, the Army has uh, really been able to hold increasingly to, to the stricture that you have to have a high school education uh, and uh, that you have to meet certain health requirements. You have to meet certain medical requirements. So you can't have any arrest record. And they're able increasingly to, to insist upon these and have fewer waivers. And so this tends to be more lower middle class and middle class than it is uh, poor uh, urban core. Does it matter that it's not represented? I think, it, I, I think that our society uh, needs to be, uh, re I don't know about represented, but I, you know, as, again, my concern is we don't even know who these uh, who these people are. We don't know who it is we're asking to do these things. I think that uh, the military has been too small, uh, and, and uh, I think uh, that's because, you know, that as a result of that, we've had multiple deployments. We've asked people to do things that, that a republic such as ours should not be. I mean, can, can you imagine four, five, and six deployments into these combat zones where every minute you're outside the gate there's some pressure you don't know when the next explosion is coming you don't know what's going to happen next and four five and six times we've sent people over there and that that that's uh, you know we need we needed to have a larger military we don't do that we need to pay for the war this is the first war in american history where we have not had a tax to pay for the war all of us in this room are basically unless you do have somebody who's serving in the military and some of you do i know that are untouched by this war. You know, you hear about it a little bit in the news, read, read, read your columns, you were just over there in Afghanistan, but uh, the, the, most people are untouched. I think, it's, I think it's, it's, it's shameful that we've not had a tax to pay for this war. Uh, during the Korean War, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Sam Rayburn, who was a Texas congressman, said, damn it, we gotta have a war tax, we can't ask these boys to go over there and fight the war and then come home and pay for the war because we've done it by debt. And people ranging from Robert Taft to Richard Nixon, the Republican Party said, you're absolutely right. And so there was a war tax. There was a surtax in Vietnam. It was too late. It was inadequate. We, we've, we fought a war with a tax cut. And we've not asked anyone to pay for it. Uh, and uh, I, I wrote to several people in Congress last summer saying it's, it's uh, time to do this. These are all people I knew on a first name basis. Not a single one of them replied to me. Nobody, <laughs> nobody wanted to hear anything about a tax. And you know, I think that the great tragedy and irony there is even the most anti-tax people would say, yeah, we, sh we really should help to pay for war. We're gonna ask these kids, you know, half of 1% or 1% of the population to come home from the war and say, now you can spend the rest of your life paying for this war that you just fought. And I just think it's, uh, it's not a way to do this. And I will so say, having we're we're not sharing in it. Having come back from Afghanistan, one of the things that struck me was how few embedded reporters were left out there. I was joking with one of my colleagues that 
it was me and then a couple of other guys, one of whom seemed to have embedded just because it came with free meals and the alternative was homelessness back in the States. But you know, an, an, another thing about that, and there are fewer reporters over there, and part of it is just the, the fact that, that obviously the media is changing dramatically. Uh, and uh, many of them are needing to cut back on budgets. Uh, the Post, the Times, NPR, a few places, you know, continue to send people over there. And, uh, and, and there's not a lot dramatic to report on. Uh, you know, it's, 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 as somebody uh, said in Vietnam, uh, you know, we were reporting on firefights that wouldn't have even had a mention during World War uh, II, and now there aren't even firefights uh, to report on in most cases. And so you report, as you did, I think, so well about being on patrol and, and worrying about IEDs and how it is you get approval to take out a group that maybe, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a different type of war. And boy, it's, it's you know, the, the drip, drip, drip. It's, it's not a front page story in most newspapers. And I think that's the great tragedy. We don't know what's going on over there. We don't know who these kids are. We're not quite sure what it is we're asking them to do. And we're not helping to pay for what they're doing. Other than that, we're all involved. <laughs> Well, why don't you guys uh, take this opportunity to get involved and ask some questions, since I've uh, gone on longer than I was supposed to, but I couldn't resist. Uh, I think there's a microphone. Yeah. OK. Thank you. I just want to go back to uh, what some, Nathaniel referred to at the beginning, the liberalization of the military. And to put it in context, that, was the class in 1968. Recently, fairly recently, I finished 42 years on active duty, most of which was at the Naval Hospital of Bethesda. I'm a physician. So I know what you see every day, because I still see it. So I was one of the last classes in Naval ROTC. And I felt that same thing you know, once I left, because I spent every summer with people from Harvard, Princeton, Yale, we all got together on our midshipman cruises, and, and I think we lost, we've lost a lot by having, and they were big units. We were like 120, just yeah. the Navy. And, uh, and so that it's probably out of the barn, so we can't bring it back. But it is a shame, and uh, is there any way back? To, to do that or not? Oh, I, th I think there is, and, 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 and I do often say to people from the 50s and 60s that say so many in our class were in ROTC, that there are two things that are different today that, that, that can't be dismissed. One is that uh, you faced a draft, and uh, going into ROTC uh, meant that you could select your branch of service and be an officer, and that wasn't trivial. And secondly, uh, the ROTC units uh, provided scholarship support, and at least schools like Dartmouth Scholarship support is available. You don't need to do that today. I used to send a, whenever I learned about a Dartmouth graduate that was serving in Iraq or Afghanistan, I used to send a care package to them. And it would be a, a Dartmouth t-shirt or cap. It would be some maple candy. And it would be a book of Robert Frost poetry. Robert Frost, uh, uh, we, we claim Robert Frost. He spent less than a semester at Dartmouth and decided <laughs> that co college wasn't for him, but it was longer than he spent any place else, so we claimed Robert <laughs> Frost, and I would send out that. And I got a note back from a Dartmouth ROTC graduate uh, who was a platoon leader with the 101st Airborne, and uh, he was over in Iraq in what was called the Triangle of Death, and he was leading patrols uh, daily over there. And he, he wrote back and he said, you know, we, 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 when we come back from these patrols, we needed some unwinding, and he said, a few months ago, I, I decided I would read some poems to the guys. And he said most of them had never gone to college. They weren't sure they wanted anybody to reading a poem to them. But it was, it was enough different from what they experienced that it was a good way to unwind. He said, since I got the Robert Frost volume from you, I've been reading that to them. And they asked me to read more to them. And, 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 and I guess I often use that as exhibit A as to what a liberal arts graduate can do in the military. Uh, there, there, there is a place. Nate Fick uh, talks about uh, after uh, uh, his unit moved into to Baghdad in early April of 2003, he, took, he was a classics major at Dartmouth and he took his platoon down to see Babylon. They should see Babylon and uh, that, what a wonderful thing to do. Now, uh, you know, Nate also said a few months after that I couldn't have gone down to Babylon unless I had a uh, an armored company uh, uh, taking me down there and providing cover because it was just a different place. But there was that window there 
where he could do that. I do think we need to do more. I do think we need to do better. One thing I've never done is recruit uh, for the military because I, I don't think, at least I can't spend as much time as I have walking these wards at the hospital and come back and say, you, got, you really got to join the Marine Sun. That's just a wonderful thing for you to do. But I sure applaud and encourage and try to support those who do make that decision. Uh, can we we'll grab this person right here in the red stripe tie? <laughs> I wonder if you could make a few comments about universal national service and also um, uh, the idea of our uh, elected officials, our Congress people, um, suggesting that they visit the Naval Hospital. Yeah, I, it's, it's, some of them do, and, and you know, it's my understanding that some of them will go out there regularly and, and you know, try to visit, at least certainly with their constituents and others, and, and others uh, see it as a photo op. And I know that the people at the hospital uh, are busy enough without photo ops, but it's hard to tell somebody not to come. But I, I do think it's crucial to, to, to go there, but not just to, to breeze through. You've really got to stop and, and talk to these guys, because I, I, I don't think we always realize what it is that we're asking people to do when we send them to war. I, I, even, even here, I don't think we, we, we know what it's like. Universal service, uh, you know, I, I'm often asked, okay, if, if, you, if you don't think the military today is representative, then what about a draft? And, 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 my, and, and it makes sense, except it doesn't, finally. And, and, and let, let me tell you why. Uh, the, there, in 2010, there are about 4.4 million 18-year-olds in the United States, or 19-year-olds or whatever. The, 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 those population groups are about the same, so let's take 18-year-olds. Uh, the military in, in that year, I think, took 170,000 accessions, new members of the military. That's about 4% of the 18-year-olds. And, and if the question is going to be, what 4%? Uh, we could do it, I guess, in a way that was more representative by having a lottery and a draft. But uh, why, if, if somebody wants to join, certainly the military today would rather have somebody who, who prefers to be there rather than somebody who's dragged in and say, I want to go to college, I want to do this, I want, no, you got to, you got to join, son. So there would still be a sense of unfairness about this, this 4% or 5% or whatever it is. And, and maybe among the young men it would be more than that because about 15% of the military today are, are women. So, and, and women are not uh, still allowed to serve in most combat roles. Although I think in the wars we're fighting today, it's harder and harder to distinguish combat from non-combat roles. But nonetheless, you know, if among men it might be a little bit higher than, than 4%, I guess. But it, it's still small. So you'd end up uh, having uh, still to make some choices. You'd, you'd be asking the the people who are training uh, these uh, uh, young, uh, young men and women uh, to take them even though they don't want to be there. And uh, you, 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 you would just, I think, make it a far more complicated thing. Now, what about uh, saying everyone owes some public service? I really do like that idea. But, uh, you know, we have trouble uh, right now managing uh, far less complicated things than deciding uh, of, of, of the, would it be 4.2 million a year that it would be left to go into public service and somebody would have to determine, okay, this fits, this doesn't, we're going to monitor to make sure you do it for a year, we're going to do this. I mean, goodness sake, I just, I, I hate to throw up the practical obstacles. Uh, when you reach my age, you can always say, oh, we tried that once and it didn't work. And I hate to, I hate to play that role, but I think it would be a complicated thing to do. This is not satisfactory today. At a minimum, we all have to take greater ownership. People say, you know, Tom Ricks had a, 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 an op-ed piece in the Post a few days ago saying it was time to have a draft again uh, because it's the only way people in Congress uh, can, can really take responsibility for a war if their own children are, uh, are liable to be sent to that war. And I just, my, my view of that is I refuse to have such a cynical view of American democracy. If the only way that we're going to balk at sending kids to war is if they're our own kids, we're not going to balk if they're somebody else's kids, then I think there's something more fundamentally <laughs> wrong than, uh, than a draft could fix. I'll say, too, on, on that score, that there are things we can do to build a more representative force without a draft. 
One of the, my favorite little statistics is I think Alabama has eight ROTC programs and New York City has two. Yeah. Um, even though New York City has a much larger population, they cost a lot more in New York City. They don't produce as many um, officers. Um, but you know, maybe efficiency is not the right measurement here. Um, uh, uh, do you want to ask a question right in front? Yeah. I have a question. Oh, okay. I know the Civil War had the most casualties with humans, but what is <clears throat> what war do you say has the most well emotional, I guess, mind-boggling on soldiers with that would get them in a, like a an uneasy feeling that would that would get them scared, feel like someone's always watching them, that the enemy is always there. What war do you say that would be? I think that that all wars, you know, going back to to to, to read uh, read uh, the Iliad, uh, all wars, read Shakespeare. Uh, you know, the people have a heavy burden coming out of war. During the Civil War, I mean, nobody talked about PTSD, obviously, or any conditions such as that. But they called it soldier's heart after the Civil War. People that had come out of that experience, and there was something wrong with them. They were. They were uptight, they were nervous, they were apprehensive, they were angry, and it was called uh, soldier's heart. Then uh, combat fatigue and battle fatigue. And, uh, and after Vietnam, uh, there was a recognition that there really was something clinical that is happening there. I think, I don't know which war would have had the most, if that's the, the thrust of your question. This war has, uh, these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan may well have the most. So some data are that maybe 35% of, of the people who served in Vietnam in the combat zones in Vietnam had some sort of traumatic stress coming out of the war. It could be higher now based on the data we have. The, the problem is that 20, 21, 22, 24 year old, particularly guys are not likely to say, I'm scared, I'm nervous, I'm angry, I'm these things. It's hard for that to, to come out. But what we've come to realize over recent years is that PTSD uh, is, is not simply a psychological reaction to trauma and stress. Uh, there's also a physical thing that can kick it off and mild uh, cognitive brain injury. And there is more of that in these wars now. Uh, people who are, serving, who are inside of vehicles when there's an explosion are suffering that. And, and uh, look, at, look at what we're learning from the National Football League. We're learning it at VA hospitals and elsewhere. Uh, uh, a, a traumatic brain injury can lead to some sort of a, uh, a, a, a psychological and emotional reaction later on. And I think we're seeing, I don't know if there's more of that now. We'll never know how many came out of World War II because they didn't talk about it. Great. Can we hit the gentleman in the light blue sweater back there? Oh. Hi, I'm Dave Deschant. I'm a Marine Combat Intelligence NCO. I served 31 months in Vietnam. Um, as you know, this year commemorates the 50th anniversary of the invasion of Vietnam, which left millions dead and five nations devastated. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, I just came from the Vietnam Memorial a few moments before coming here. As Memorial Day comes around, think about my generation and what size memorials would be in Vietnam. <clears throat> I have a question now. Um, Smedley Butler, General, Marine Corps, received the Medal of Honor twice. And he radically noted that war is a racket and it is conducted for the benefit of a very few at the expense of very many. Out of war, a few people make huge profits. You mentioned, uh, Professor, that um, American citizens have to get more involved. How do we do that if all politics are local? And the only way the war comes home is when a body bag comes home to your community. How do we, as citizens of a democracy, the best and the brightest, hold the decision makers accountable for their folly? I, I, think, I, I think it has to start with decision makers being willing to share more with us and, and be more honest about what it is that's going on, about talking more directly about uh, cost and consequence. Uh, the, the recent war, I mean, Going back to the Korean War, uh, every war that we fought, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cover, include Operation Desert Storm, which, which was not a sustained war. It was a specific objective. It was met, and we withdrew. But the other wars, each of them, uh, the, the purposes changed as the war went on. We went into Korea. Uh, to uh, throw the North Koreans back across the 38th parallel, they could stop their invasion of South Korea. 
Then we began to change what it is we're trying to do. And in the early fall of 1950, late 1950, the Chinese came in, threw us back uh, across the 38th parallel. We went into, we went into negotiations of Pam and John finally. Uh, Vietnam, we started talking in Paris. How are we going to end this war? And the purpose of that war changed. Iraq, uh, we went in to find weapons of mass destruction and get Saddam Hussein out, and, and uh, that war evolved. Uh, Afghanistan, we, we went in to, to, to get uh, Al Qaeda and throw out the Taliban because of their complicity in 9 11, and uh, the, a worthy goal. But then the objectives uh, changed over time. And, and, and objectives can change. Uh, the, the, this, this is a very complicated world, and I just think that there needs to be more. Uh, discussion up front about what this is going to be about and what the objectives are going to be. We all have to buy into it. I, I don't go back to the Colin Powell uh, idea about uh, massive force and you, you, you know, there are certain wars where you, you can't win with massive force. You can't go in knowing what the end is going to be. But uh, I do think that, that there has to be more sharing up front. We have to, to buy in more. It's too easy to fight wars today is the real tragedy. It is too easy for this to happen, except for those who are fighting the wars, believe me, this is not easy. I'll take uh, one from over there. Uh, Charles Sills, my company is a service uh, disabled veteran owned small business. And uh, my question is, um, you mentioned the multiple deployments in this particular time frame. How can, what kind of policy could we try to legislate or put into effect that would mitigate or prevent, uh, especially the National Guard troops from being redeployed so many times and interrupting, breaking up uh, their lives uh, because they're already ensconced with families and they, of course, they stayed involuntarily in the National Guard, but then they probably didn't expect to be deployed three or four times. So yeah. maybe we can do something about that. I think, I think if we're gonna fight wars like this, uh, we need to have a bigger military. We certainly need to have a, a larger army infantry and paratroop and a larger Marine Corps because of, of, of what it is that we've asked them uh, to do. Uh, in Korea, we sent in the National Guard in that summer of 1950, and, 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 the, and the guardsmen that were sent over there were so upset. Many of them were World War II veterans who had stayed in the Guard or the Reserves, and they said, we fought our war, what the hell do you mean? We don't want to go to another one. And so there was a, a political firestorm. Truman brought them all home, and he went to the draft and enlistments. Uh, Lyndon Johnson had learned the lesson well. He did not want to call up the Guard or the Reserves for Vietnam. He went to the draft, and increasingly heavily on the draft. Uh, to sustain the force. So in 1973, interestingly, under pressure from the military more than civilians, uh, there was a recognition that if we're going to go to the all-volunteer army, there has to be a willingness to call up the National Guard and the Reserve sooner in the result of a, in the event of a war, sooner than we had, obviously, in Vietnam and Korea. And so that was embedded in the all-volunteer army concept. And we've called them up multiple times. Uh, because of the concept, the idea that would be a tripwire, which is what Tom Ricks was talking about in his column in, in the Post. That uh, you know, if, if if you know somebody is over there, you're going to be much more cautious about the war. It's not clear that they've served as a tripwire. Some studies have indicated that the communities that have sent over uh, guard and reserve units uh, have been more supportive of the war than than other communities have, and that's that's fine. But if the idea of a tripwire is, is more reluctant to go to war, it hasn't doesn't work that way. Um, um, right there in the pink sweater. Hi, my name is Christy Kaufman. Hi, Greg, who are you? Um, uh, uh, I've been an Army wife for almost 11 years now, so I think it's impossible to have this discussion when we're talking about those who have borne the battle without bringing that up. This is the most married military we've ever had. I think over 50% of both Army and Marines um, have families. So when we... <laughs> I work for an organization called Code of Support, and we're looking to bridge the gap between civilian and military America. So if there is one commonality, everybody has families. And I think that if we can broaden the discussion when we talk about the impacts of war and talk about what's happened with the spouses and the children and the parents, that might be an effective way to, to start to bridge that gap. Because I'll tell you, 
we're pretty tired. When you talk about three, yeah. four, five deployments, that's not just the service member that's going through that, that's the family members as well. So we're hopeful that if we can, we, when we have books like this, and I really appreciate you uh, writing it and, and looking at it in the larger pers perspective, is how do, we have, how do we make people care? Someone brought that up. How do we engage, when there's less than 1% of this population, how do we engage the rest of this country? I think part of that is going to be telling the stories about the families and, as well, both the stress and then the, and the accomplishments. Yes, you're absolutely right. I think, in fact, 56% of the people serving in the military today are, are married. It, just, it, it is not uh, their father's uh, army anymore. It's, it's a different sort of military service. Uh, the people stay in for more than one term. They're, they're very professional. And uh, I do talk uh, some in my book. I, I, I don't address it as, 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 as great a length as I'd like about the stress on families and what it is, uh, uh, the pressure it puts upon them. And, uh, and uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that uh, a lot of the, a, a lot of the, the, the pressure that, that guys who are serving are feeling has to do with the stress that their families are having and uh, they're having to deal with that. They come back from a deployment and the, and the family conversation is, it's great to be home, when do you have to go back again? And do you know what I have to do when you're over there? Do you know how complicated it is to, do you know how it is to wait every day for a phone call? Do you know, I mean, it, 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 it's a tremendous pressure. And uh, I don't know uh, uh, how we can, again, how do you get a, a country like ours to, to understand and to buy in and then support I think that's the crucial question because you are bearing the burden alone in most cases. I'm on the board of the, of the uh, Semper Fi Fund and a couple of my uh, board members are here and this is, is supportive primarily of, of, uh, of, of injured Marines, but uh, I have to say most of our money goes to families uh, rather than to the, you know, the injured Marines, you know, the government more or less takes care of their needs if they need some help buying an automobile that, with different controls or, or or changing their house, we can do that, but it's the families uh, that most of our support goes to. Great, we'll go way there in the back. Okay, one, two, we've been trying to get in from back here. I'm Colonel Retired Cameron Ritchie, I'm an Army Psychiatrist, and I'd like to circle back to your discussion about where is the focus of the media now because I've watched it over the last 10 years as it's first been in the theater of war, but now it seems to be coming back to reintegration and all the issues around reintegration. And the balance that I think many of us are trying to figure out is that the one, one time you want to highlight the difficulties and provide support, but on the other hand, you don't want to over-dramatize them, focus too much on the violence, and make the employer scared. I've said this before in other forums, but I think the most critically important thing we can do is to provide jobs to our returning vets. And the more we can, as a nation, do that, the better it'll be, in my opinion. I agree, Jay. The unemployment rate, the homelessness uh, for veterans is higher than it is for the population as a whole. And this, this, is, this is beyond embarrassing. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's terrible. Uh, I, I think that you, you put your finger on a, on a terribly important uh, concern, though. Do people think that those who have served in combat because of PTSD and other things are going to be a little bit loony, are going to be a little bit undependable? And, and, and that's what the Vietnam veterans faced. Uh, uh, I, I, I refer in the book to a, a Kojak episode in, in the early 70s. There was a murder in New York City. I remember Telly Savalas in Kojak a murder in New York City, and this is on national te you know, a television show. And uh, Co. Jack says to one of his guys, see if, see if anybody just got discharged recently as a Vietnam veteran, we gotta try to track down uh, who did this. And, 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 and sort of the idea of the loony veteran, the movies of the, of the 70s, Apocalypse Now. Remember, I mean, these, these guys were on a joyride. They were all scary as hell. And the, 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 these are fiction. This, this is not representing uh, the experience in Vietnam. But, but there was this, and I think that there's a real recognition today, and people do draw back. And, and I remember having a conversation with somebody on the whole issue of employment. Do some uh, employers back off a little bit from hiring veterans because they're afraid, you know, this, this guy could unwind at some time. I don't mean unwind and, 
and go postal and start shooting people, but just not be dependable because uh, maybe there's some psychological problem there. And that, 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 just, that just compounds what is a tragedy to start with. And, and part of it has to do with the whole problem, as, as you know professionally, of making us understand even better uh, some of the ranges of, 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 of emotional problems that people have. That, uh, that this, this is a, a medical condition. We have to help people deal with it, and we can't be dismissive of them. Um, well, this is our uh, last question. I guess I promised it to the, uh, to the back as well. I'll let you guys both go. Thank you. Um, I'd like to echo what Dr. Ritchie was saying about our veterans coming home and they, you know, have fought hard and long, and the press and the media sometimes uh, doesn't put it in perspective for the rest of the country. And I think that's something that would be nice to look in, into, and if you run out of things to write about, that might be one of them. But that was just a comment. But um, I happen to be a nurse over at one of the military hospitals here. I'm a civilian and I work directly with the soldiers coming home from Afghanistan and Iraq. And many of them are women. And I was wondering, um, historically, have you seen any um, increase in support for the women soldiers who come home and have amputations, um, they have PTSD, they have brain injuries, They've lost their eyesight to IEDs. Just like anyone in combat, they're not combatants, they're not on the front line officially, but they're there. And I think uh, as far back as World War I, if not further, we've had women veterans and women soldiers in all of the services. And I'm wondering if any, it seems like the medical community is well represented here tonight, if anyone has seen any progress in support of the women soldiers. Um, can you comment on that, or have I, you seen anything? Uh, I, I've, I've, not, I've not seen any, any data on that. Uh, I, I think that the women soldiers who are suffering from, from, from combat or from battle injuries are, are treated uh, the same as men, uh, and, and uh, at least I want to count on that. Uh, women soldiers uh, that are, that are, that are suffering from things that have not earned them a Purple Heart, uh, suffering from other forms of trauma, suffering from, from the environment, the culture of, of the military, which uh, still is very tough for women. And uh, I think that women have to endure a great deal uh, in many of the commands uh, still. We've, we've gotten better, but uh, we're a long way from having addressed some of the issues of of uh, sexual insult, sexual abuse, sexual assault, it's just, uh, it's, it's there. And uh, I think that the, the military is, is, is trying at the upper levels uh, to force uh, uh, commands to deal with this and address it. Uh, I don't think anyone would uh, pretend that they've done it at all successfully yet, but they, they've made progress. I, I make a comment in my, in my book that in, in, in all, many of the great issues, when I went, went in the Marine Corps, it was just integrating. There were some of the first black Marines, and there was a lot of racial tension then. Uh, I do think that the, on, on issues having to do with race and gender and sexual orientation, uh, the military institutionally has probably done as well as any institution in American society. We'll, 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 we'll wait on sexual orientation, but I think that they're off to a good start in dealing with the repeal of don't ask and don't tell. The, the command structures are addressing it. I think culturally the military doesn't do nearly as well. That there is, there is a, 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 a culture in the military that, uh, that pushes back against this. I think Vietnam finally dealt with issues of race. It was pretty hard to be dismissive of, of black soldiers and Marines in Vietnam and saying these guys can't fight. Uh, and and if, if the test was who has the highest testosterone, uh, black Marines and soldiers could stand up uh, next to anybody, and, uh, and but I think once you once you run away from this, uh, from 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 stereotypes of a of a of a male culture and start having more women, uh, more people whose sexual orientation uh, is different, uh, then the cultural tension is even greater. I don't think anyone would pretend uh, that it's been easy, but the burden has fallen as it always does on those. Uh, uh, who have been suffering discrimination. 
Well, great. I think that's all the time we have. I asked too many questions, and I denied you guys. I'm sorry about that. But you can continue to ask uh, Dr. Wright questions after uh, the presentation, and he'll be signing books in the back. So thanks very much for coming. Thank great you questions. so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.